we are, friends. Welcome. It feels a little surreal after not being in this space for so long, but we want to welcome you to this new academic year, to this chapel, which has been empty since March 2020. Welcome to this community, which is so much bigger than all of us that are in this space. Welcome to those who are joining us from afar via technology. We remember our sisters and brothers in Logan and Stateville who do not have access to this space or the technology, but know that they are with us here in spirit and with prayer. And so welcome to this time of worship where each week we'll gather to listen, to listen to God through the word and through song, to listen to the spirit who speaks to our spirit, and to remember that the love of God is beyond our understanding, but resides deep within our souls and within our community. And we gather to respond to what we hear in the world we inhabit, that God's kingdom may come just a little closer. So this morning we are excited to hear from Dean Kirsten, who usually preaches this first chapel of the Lord to what he has for us in this afternoon. So welcome, welcome to worship today. Just by way of reminder, in this space, we'll continue to follow campus protocol, which for now is to wear masks in all indoor spaces, and so we will come up front as well. You can inhabit the space here where you are comfortable. There's plenty of room to spread out, so if you feel like you need to be by yourself a little more, there's plenty of room to do that. You're welcome to sing and respond with your mask on, and you're welcome to not sing. For now, we will be refraining from celebrating communion together, but we look forward to the day when we can once again. So we're glad to be here together to enter into the space of worship and to come gather to grow in discipleship and community. So let's stand together as we respond and bring this service to God. Respond together from Psalm 146. Please read. And we pray this song together. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord, Do not put your trust in princes or mortals in whom there is no help. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. Who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoner free. The Lord The Lord watches over the strangers. He holds the orphan and the widow, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. The God of Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Let us sing together from our hymnals, which are in your queue. Number 27. Sing praise to God. Praise the Lord. Thank you. 
charge to lead us in a time of prayer, um, but before I do that, I want to read a short verse from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians to remind us why prayer is so important. Uh, verse 5, or chapter 5, verses 16 through 18 in the letter of 1 Thessalonians, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We pray because we have a God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead and has the power to redirect human history for his purposes. No matter how dark the thread and the tapestry of life, he improvises and redirects even the aftermath of tragedy in new directions and sews that dark thread in the tapestry of his good and perfect will for us. So we need to pray. Because our prayers change history and they change people's lives. God adds something. And we pray because our hearts need it. Our hearts need prayer. Our hearts get weary by the troubles of this world, by a pandemic, by the violence, by the division, by the failure of the church to bear witness to the love and grace of God. Prayer makes bad soil good because God meets us in prayer and He changes us. So with that, let us pray for the world, our nation, and our campus community. Let's pray. Uh, we should pray for many things. But I want to be praying for the world. Let's look at uh, 2.6 million Afghans through the course of 40 years of conflict, natural disasters, chronic poverty, war, and most recently, recently the COVID-19 pandemic are living in other countries. 30,000 Afghans are leaving each week, some at the risk of their lives, men, women, and children. Let's pray that God will intervene and that he will move the nations of the world to see those who need our love and our hospitality. Let's pray. And as we pray, I invite you, for those online and those here, to pray out loud, whether it's a whisper, or with loud words so that you want to pierce the clouds with your prayers. Let's pray out loud in unison for those who are fleeing from Afghanistan. Let's pray. Father, Church. 
Let's pray for the nation. Hurricane Ida has produced flooding, left people with no power, no water, no shelter. In Louisiana, up the northeast coast, in Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and now in the Boston area. Let's pray for the church and help during this time. And that those who need God's rescue will experience his delivering hand. So let's pray together for those who have experienced loss, suffering, and need God's help during this time when Hurricane Ida has left this afternoon. Let's pray. Father, Simon, Buddy, pray that Let's pray now for our North Park community. Let's remember our new students. We have new students on campus. Some have traveled thousands of miles and are internationals in a new place, a new culture, a new language. Let's pray for them and, and those who have come from other smaller distances, nevertheless, have followed God's call to this place. Let's remember our online and distance learners who have also been sacrificed. Created a space that they can study and answer God's call to ministry. Let's remember the new cohorts in Ignite and Equip. Let's remember our new students in the School of Restorative Arts in Stateville and Logan. And let's remember a flood of college students that have left home and are here because they believe that they have answered God's call. So, so let's pray for our new students in particular now. And we'll also pray for I thank you that for the Let's pray for our whole secondary community. Let's pray for the church. Let's pray for the uh, university. Let's pray that in a time of pandemic, God will be that we be safe, healthy, and strong. And while weariness of body and illness is something we always have to guard against, let's pray that God will strengthen us when we experience weariness of our soul, when we go down past and be by the world. Let's pray that, and, and that God will unite us in our desperation for Him. Let's pray for all seminary and our faculty and our folks. Heavenly Father, we stop. Heavenly Father, we Scott, Lord, we thank you that we pray. We ask first and foremost, change our hearts, make it in soil. And answer our prayers. We have lifted up nation and we lifted it up 
the world, and we lifted up our North Park community, and we lifted up the church. Lord, you know that we are flesh and bone, dust the earth. We are frail, but you are mighty and you are able. And we have prayed these things because you are good. We have prayed these things because you are able. And we pray these things because when it comes to prayer, God is never late in answering the cries of his people. This we pray in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We will now have our scripture reading coming out of the book of Mark, Gospel, chapter 1, verses 35 to 49. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place. And there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is where I came out to be. And he went through Galilee, proclaiming the message in the synagogues and casting out demons. A leper came to him, begging him and kneeling. He said to him, if you choose, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I do choose, be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. After sternly warning him, he sent him away at once, saying to him, See that you may say that you say nothing to anyone, but go. Show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the word so that Jesus could no longer go into a town openly, but stay out in the country. And the people came to him from every quarter. The word of the Lord. Send your word to you, Lord. Lead me, guide me every day. Send your anointing, Father, I Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I extend my welcome. How delighted we are to be gathered, to be here, to be in this first week of this first semester of this academic year. How good, how good that, that really is for each of us, and uh, we we are delighted. We are in uh, we are in Mark's gospel, and uh, 
I've, uh, I've posed something here. Does Mark, in these two panels of scripture that are somewhat unrelated, uh, does Mark uh, offer something for us? Maybe, maybe the way of Jesus. You know, you, 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 Mark's gospel is, uh, is unique in its intensity and pace. We're in the first chapter, and there's already been a casting out of demons. There's already been a healing. There's a, his baptism has occurred. There's no long genealogies. It, it's all action. The, the term of being on the way or on the road with Jesus is a marketing term. term. It's, it's, it's describing the Christian life as, as, as fast, as urgent. And they're, they're always on the road. They're always on the way. And so, so that Mark is laying that out in this first chapter. But he's also laying something out for us, which might be, how does Jesus do all this? How does he maintain this pace? How does he live this life? Is there a spirituality of Jesus? Is, is there a, a way to do life and faith that he's modeling for us, that he's cadencing into uh, these early chapters and these early verses? Um, if you let me answer that question, I'm going to say yes, there is. <laughs> um, and I'm a preacher, so well, okay. Um, but yes, uh, Jesus is kind of tipping his hand here and marking his Narration with all of this pace is, is saying, pay attention to this, though, that with all of this urgent pace, with, with the, all of this action, uh, there are no problems. And pay attention. Pay attention to those, to those pauses. We could go forward so far as to say that maybe with its pace, with its intensity, with, uh, with the way it uh, delivers the message, that Mark might be, uh, I'm not a John guy, as it goes, but Mark might be the quintessential gospel of our time based on that. The last verse, verse 45, they, you know, they're coming at him after he's, after he's done the healing, after, uh, after he's cleansed the leper, after he's, after he's preached, they're coming at him from all directions, really, what the lightning indicates. From north and south and east and west, they're coming Right, yeah, that, that's the scene. So, well, how does Jesus then do? How does he hold up in all of this? And uh, I think I think the, the, the gospel narrator and Jesus himself is, uh, is is hinting and tilting that to us in these in these opening verses of Mark's gospel. What is the spirituality of Jesus? Cadence into Mark's gospel are these words very early in the morning, long before the dawn. Jesus gets up and goes to a solitary place, a lonely place. He goes to wilderness. He goes to desert. In fact, the word actually translates desert then. Uh, to pray. What's that about? What is that about? Why, why, why are they telling us that? Why is that narrated in here? Um, very early in the morning, long before the dawn, Jesus gets up and he goes to the lonely place to pray. This, this is a touchstone. This is a reoccurring moment and pause within Mark's gospel to remind us of something. All this activity, all this urgent, urgent action, Gospel kingdom action, it has a source. It, 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 it's drawing from something. And it's drawing from his life and prayer. But more than that, the, the, the desert, the lonely place, and the wilderness, it's um it indicates something further. It indicates transformation. It indicates a place where we are changed. And in particular, in particular, I would like to say that what is being transformed for Jesus, for anybody, anybody in this kingdom work, anybody out there doing it, anybody carrying this burden, um, he's, uh, he's saying that it, it has to be done from a place, a deep interior place of prayer, where the stalking Loneliness of spiritual leadership. The stopping loneliness of spiritual leadership is transformed into a true solitude with the Father. 
That's the source. That, that, that's what the very early in the morning, long before the dawn. That's why that comes again and again in Mark's gospel. That, that, that touchstone, that, that place, going intentionally to the place of, of, of transformation, moving from a self-consciousness of pain and even a self-consciousness of our own dirty and our own traumas to a, a, a place of transformation, of healing, of self-awareness. That, that's where the good work for each of us comes from. So we, we hear, we answer the question, the spirituality of Jesus is a spirituality of transformation. It's a spirituality born in the wilderness, in the desert, in the lonely place, in that transformative moment of work with the Father. Now, here's the deal. That's a deep lesson for the first week of seminary. <laughs> um, that's a deep lesson for anybody in public ministry. That's, that's probably the deep and maybe lost lesson of our day. That most people in public ministry uh, do not have a sufficient interior life to sustain their public ministry. Now, um, that's a little harsh, but you know, I'm, in, I'm in it 40 years now. Uh, I'm speaking of my own life. Uh, and I'm speaking it as a calling. While you're here at school, lay this down, lay this deep ribbon down. You know, I, I'm not a morning person, so it's not very early in the morning for me, but, but there is a place of solitude. There is a place of transformative work. There is a place of prayer that, that, that hopefully sustains my public ministry. And, and I, uh, I offer that to you. I, uh, I did my doctorate of ministry on the spirituality of preaching. And uh, I did all the, the research and the ethnographic work and studies and interviewed people. Um, you know, and it was, it was really complex. It was uh, basically the premise was if I pray more, will I preach them? And if you look at homiletics text, it's kind of, there's just now in the literature some really good writing on this. But when I was doing this back in the 90s, you had to go back to the 1700s to find some comment on the interior life of the priest. Um, now, you could go do that four year study I did and pull you know, your friends from your congregation and do the ethnographic research and everything. Or you could just believe me when I say, if you preach more, you will pray them. If you, if, excuse me, if you pray more, wow, that was Freudian. Thank you. <laughs> if you, if you, uh, if you pray more, uh, you'll preach them. Uh, and uh, you know that 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 line about most black people don't have a significant enough interior life. Well, true. Uh, I don't think the people they serve are the first victim of that deficit. I don't think I don't think the church is. I think most people in ministry, most people in nonprofit, they suck it up and do it anyway, and do it pretty well. The victim, the first victim of that is who? Then, yeah, they they wound themselves and they they take some of their own personal presence and power away from their work. When they aren't, when their interior life is not prepared for what they're doing. So I had a friend who uh, was one of the early graduates of the Center for Spiritual Direction here. Uh, took, the, took the direction training, and the first year of it, he had to go into direction himself. He had to live in And he was a good guy, kind of your journeyman pastor, town and country Minnesota the whole way, uh, but a really solid, solid pastor. And he'd been at church a while, and he'd been in the program about half a year. And he came into the church on a Monday morning, and the women of the church, this is Rolling and Soda, I mean, more years ago, the women of the church were cleaning the building, <laughs> cleaning up after something. And uh, they were all in the kitchen for coffee, though, and he came in. Pastor, Pastor, we were just talking about you. And it was Monday morning. You know, I've been there a while. Of course, you were. You know, kind of like thought of the pastor. But anyway, no, no, pastor. 
century. Really, it's not that. Master, uh, what's up? Uh -huh. Things are good. Things are good at home. Yeah, you know, things are good. No, no, no. What's up with you? And he said, I, I don't know what you're asking. And finally, they said, Your preaching has never been more present, more personal, more powerful than the last few months. What's up with you? But he goes back to his study and sits at the desk and scratches his bald head and, and the only thing he can come up with is that he was paying attention to his interior life through direction like he never had before. Yeah, if you pray more and are accountable, if you're doing that transformative work, you will be more present to everyone in this. In the preaching moment, in the teaching moment, in the counseling moment, in the service moment, you will be authentically present. This is what uh, this is what Mark and Jesus are tilting to us. So the spirituality of Jesus, what is this? It's a spirituality of transformation. It's a spirituality of the desert or the wilderness or the lonely place. We'll take that. We'll hear that. Secondly, there's there's kind of a throwaway line of narration in there. That he went around to the synagogue, the, the towns and villages, and stopped at all the synagogues and, and read the text and preached. Why is that? His spirituality is a spirituality of prayer and transformation, but it's also a spirituality of the word. His life is anchored in the word, it's sustained in the word. He went to the synagogue, you know, if you had 10 righteous families, you could have a synagogue, you could have a scroll, and you, you open that Torah scroll, or you open the, the scroll of the prophets, and, you know, and you, and you would read, and it was a public moment, it was read aloud, it was read aloud for, you know, to, so it would strike the eardrum and enter and echo the body, and, uh, and they took it very seriously. Have you ever read Ezra when the walls rebuilt and they read the, the law, the Torah for the first time? The people are weeping because they, they hadn't heard it, they hadn't experienced the word in, in years. And uh, yeah, the ancients had something there. They had a deep connection to the word. And uh, there, there, there was a practice in the ancient world, in the early, in the early synagogue world. Where they they uh, began at the middle of the week, they would pivot towards the Shabbat and begin to imagine and wonder about the coming week. To think of it, to invite it. It, uh, it was called something like Torah anticipation, where they were longing, longing to hear the scriptures read, longing to be in the book. and. Uh, Jesus enters that world. Jesus honors that world. Jesus does his preaching and teaching in that system, in that world. And so they would, uh, they would hear the word. The scroll would be hurled, would be opened, the text would be read, the rabbi would preach. And then there would be kind of a communal discerning and discussing. And only, and then, uh, then they would go into their week with the Torah, with the Word, with the prophets, and uh, so it's Torah, Torah anticipation in the ancient world. The week going towards Shabbat, coming from Shabbat is Torah after Shabbat. It's like that word is still vibrating. That word is still speaking. That word. That word is still burning within us. Um, a, a presence, a, a, a deep, a deep formation. Jesus, Jesus is offering that. He's offering that. Now, while you're here sitting there, you're going to read a lot of scripture, right? You're already behind, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> about this time of the week, you're about a thousand pages down. That's not just the Bible. Um, but uh, I, I want to offer something. While 
the vital field that every faculty member is going to give you every possible historical interpretation of the text, textual, canonical interpretation of the text, the right hermeneutics, the, the, the right way to, to work with the translations, the original language where appropriate. You're going to do all that. You need to do all that. You need to be immersed in that whole world. But there's there's one thing I want to offer in, that, in the midst of all that. You're gonna, and you're gonna you're gonna have you know you're gonna have all the technology too. You know? You're gonna have Logos and, and the Bible soft and well, I don't know what the term is on it actually, but um, but so somebody correct me. Uh, but you're gonna have you're gonna have resource like no other generation of the faith has had. Um, and, and a great deal of it up. But I don't want you to miss this. When the ancients came and heard the text, we, we take a very modern approach. We take the assumption that the, the text is ancient and naive. And it kind of needs our help. Right? Uh, it needs all those resources. It needs, it needs our, our, our work. And we, we take the approach that I'm going to get this right. You know, I mean, I had, you guys don't know, but the former New Testament professor here, Clive Snodgrass, was always over my shoulder every sermon I ever wrote. You know, was I honoring the text? Was I, you know, he, you know, his interpretation was always way more lean than anything I came up with. You know, uh, getting, getting that word right. And I want you to do all that. I want you to learn all that. But this, the Torah anticipation, the Torah afterglow, it has a different stance. The, the, the modern stance, the contemporary stance, the technological stance we take over scriptures to place ourselves over the text, right? And, and the goal is, it's a very noble goal, get the text right. Get it right. Know what the original audience was hearing. Know what the original intent was. Begin to interpret towards what it means today. Yes, yes, yes. But don't miss this. Um, the stance that's being called for out of this illusion to the synagogue, to Torah, anticipation, and Torah afterwards, almost the opposite, is to place ourselves under the word, all of us. Teacher, preacher, every student, professor, we are under the word of God. And, and, and the question isn't just will we get it right? We better do our homework or we better get it right. But that's not the question. The question is will the text, will the word of God, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, will it get us from back to the transformation? This is what Jesus is offering. This is what this narration is offering for us to contemplate and ponder a little bit of the first week of seminary. Will it get me right? Will it get me right? I remember hearing the dean of the seminary when I was here preach at a local church. And we, you know, he was he was kind of a epic figure, kind of a rally bear. Pictures of it, but uh, I remember him preaching and talking about preaching. And when he sat down to hear the sermon, he wanted to know if there was any hope for him. That's what he came up with. He was looking. He was looking for that word that would get him right. And we should be too. In the classroom, in the in the chapel. Congregation, wherever we're doing this word based work, we can have that deep motivation. So it's a spirituality of the desert, uh, the wilderness of the lonely places, a spirituality of the word. Um, it's a spirituality of encounter. Then enters the leper crying out from the, the way. All of this action, they're, they're on the way, they're marching along, and then somebody needs something. Sir, sir, if you will. 
I can be made clean. And this is this is true of Mark's gospel. While there are these pauses, there are also these out and out interruptions. The woman with the issue of love. The garden of the sin. <laughs> you know, there, there's there are these moments where the pace stands still and a voice cries out. It cries out to God. A spirituality of an interruption, but but maybe even more, a spirituality demanding encounter. Sir, if you are willing, I can do that. Now. That we we would live our lives, do our work as students and professors. That the encounter and the interruption is important as every urgently planned moment in the syllabus, in the calendar, in anything. That we're, we're open, we're open to that moment of deep encounter when a voice cries out with a deep, deep, with a deep. It has some echoes of Jacob here, or Job. It, uh, it echoes deep in scripture when that voice cries out, Sir, if you are willing, I can be made whole. And it, you know, there's a line from Flannery O'Connor that that which is most personal is also most beautiful. The heart cry, the heart cry spoken, and the heart cry heard is, uh, is universal. Pay attention. Pay attention for the moment of encounter. You might, as a student, be the moment of encounter and interruption for a professor who desperately needs you. It goes in both directions. The cry, the cry of the heart. So the spirituality, the spirituality of encounter. The text has a real awkwardness in it. Did anybody notice it? Jesus' response. Anybody see it in a different translation as it was read? Anybody catch it? it it's often translated Jesus full of compassion. There are several manuscripts on them. that trans that the, the word is actually Jesus. What's in the nature? Jesus. You know, the tough Jesus. The Jesus that doesn't square. Jesus was spot. And about what? About the plight of the leprosy? About the interruption? About what? What was in the nature? It was also full of compassion. It's not a, not a bad view. He does say he's willing to be healed. He can be willing to be healed. Right? Well, let's stay with that indignant. The text begins to answer. The last part in verse 45, you know, the guy he heals the guy, and then what does he do? He heals him and then not tell Jesus. Right? So it's hang on to the indignation for a moment. He shushes him. Right? Don't tell anyone. Of course, the guy leaves, and once he do, he goes up to the That's why everybody's coming out at the end of all the Okay. What, uh, what, if, what if that shushing, what if that shushing actually means something? What if, what if it's, it's part of what uh, the scholars call the messianic secret, where Jesus 
continually kind of withholds, withholds, withholds his full presence until the Lord is born. Okay. What if it's, what if it's more like that? And, and what if this indignation is demon type? Like, don't get it wrong. Of, of course, I want to cure that horrible skin disease and, and make your life better. Of course. Of course. But don't miss this now. Don't get this wrong. That's not the only reason. I mean, that's not the reason. And, and maybe, maybe the shushing is to invite us to wait and to, us and to look at all that Jesus does, every teaching, every healing, every raising of the dead, every, every encounter, to look at it ultimately <coughs> through the world, through his death. With exactly what doesn't want you jumping to the first to the first part of it, the first answer you might hold is compassion. So all of it, I, I just don't want to cure you. I want to raise you up. I, I, I want to make this whole world right and do again. I, I, I want the whole of it. He's, he's leaving room for that at the end of the He's in this narration. And so I, I would call that there's four parts to Jesus' spirituality. I would call that a spirituality of focus and attention. He knows because he's because he's been up early in the morning and with the Father, <laughs> he knows who he is. And he knows what he's doing. Where he's going. Because he's deep in the word, because he's under the word, uh, he's, he's got the, the resource for it all. Because he's open to the heart cry, he's engaging the present focus of the world. But he has a focus. And uh, Mark. Mark wants to narrate us towards that. Spirituality of Jesus. It's uh, it's for everybody working in ministry. It's for every professor and dean. It's for every student. May we be blessed. May we have interior lives that allow for our flourishing and our growth. Then, then we'll be fully formed and, and ready ready for the work God has us in and God is calling us to. Amen? Amen. Amen? Let's stand and we sing together.